Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today's episode is part of our series on Stalin, episode 12, The Red Tiberius and the Game of Thrones. Usually, when we're looking to make friends, we like people who are interesting or similar to us, but our favourite friends are the ones we can really relax around, where there's no pressure to perform or impress people, and you can just be yourself. In this sense, Stalin had very few friends. He had a sense of personal loyalty to many people. He even sent some of his old school friends from the gory spiritual seminary money in the post. But friendship doesn't seem like the ideal description. Could you be friends with someone anyway who had the power to kill you at any moment? Nearly everyone he associated with was a political associate, and after the Great Terror they were all terrified that he would turn on them and have them liquidated, as he had done with so many other old friends along the way. As Robert Service puts it, in the mid-1930s he had turned to the families of his wives for company, but then he had killed or arrested several of them, and the survivors were in a state of psychological shock not conducive to a dinner party atmosphere. End quote. Of his surviving family, he had only ever really liked Svetlana, and their relationship had deteriorated as soon as she started dating. It was the resistance to his will that he disliked the most. Amongst the unsuitable candidates for marriage was Beria's son, who, perhaps uniquely among individuals, could understand what it was like to be the child of a murderous tyrant. Service even accounts a borderline upsetting incident in 1948, where he invited his surviving school friends from Gori to stay with him. Quite often, meeting old school friends you haven't seen in a while brings with it a certain kind of awkwardness. The affection's no longer present. Your lives have diverged since you first met, and you no longer have anything in common. What could Stalin, this man who straddled the world, have in common with anyone from Gori? And so, after a few days of awkward conversation and drinking, his school friends left early. So he was left with the Politburo. Imagine going on a night out with Stalin, after the war, after the terror. It's not such a ridiculous idea because we have countless memoirs documenting Stalin's love of all-night alcoholic parties. They all describe how Stalin loved to stay up late at night, engaging in drinking games and watching movies. He would occasionally watch the Soviet-produced films, which always had a heavy element of propaganda, but personally preferred Western movies, although he usually kept them censored from the rest of the USSR, just as he had suppressed his beloved Dostoevsky. There's something you see, and it's not just Western cultural imperialism, but in all of the states of the USSR and East Germany and so on, there was a everyone had a penchant for the foreign films because they were still the best. He also temporarily banned scenes of kissing in films, which I actually kind of approve of. There is a paradoxical relationship in Soviet states to Hollywood films. They represent the worst of the bourgeoisie culture, and the hero is always terribly politically incorrect. You know, they're never on behalf of the state, it's always individuals. But they were a guilty political pleasure, and the few that made it through the censors always performed incredibly well at the box office. Stalin's love of westerns in particular, cowboy films, is well documented, and in some ways you can see why. Khrushchev reports that he'd watched them, condemn their ideology, and then order more. They might not have been properly Marxist, but they were closer to Stalin's own personality, the gruff outsider who returns to the community for revenge, following his own strict and sometimes mysterious moral code, capable of violence and cool under pressure. They are the American version of the Georgian Abrex that he so idolised. Koba, the literary hero that he named himself after, was not so far from John Wayne. John Wayne in particular was a figure of great concern. Stalin wanted him assassinated for his anti-communist views. Stalin also loved gangster movies, particularly those where the ruthless gang leader guns down his rivals. There's no doubt in my mind that he would have been a big Tarantino fan, and he probably would have loved The Godfather too. His sardonic, mocking side would come out during the scenes where a gang leader disposed of an underling who'd got too big for his boots, and the message was lost on no one. Khrushchev reports that he was, quote, reminding us that we were temporary people. He was not immune to the Russian tendency towards drink. I mean, vodka has its etymology in the Russian for water. Stalin never displayed any signs of being an alcoholic, however. Perhaps he remembered how it had destroyed his father and displayed better self-control. There was a competitive, even political element to these drinking sessions in more ways than one. As well as indulging in drinking games, Stalin liked to use alcohol as a tool of power 
He would quite frequently pretend to be taking shots of vodka that was, in reality, water or wine. Being the only sober person in a crowd full of drunks is tedious. But you can learn things that way if you're willing to take advantage of loose tongues. Churchill and Stalin had engaged in an all-night drinking session in Moscow. Maybe he was trying the same trick, but Churchill was a notorious drinker, who was probably tipsy for most of the Second World War. Chances are Stalin wasn't able to drink him under the table. It's bizarre to imagine Stalin in the role of a boorish student, chastising all of his inner circle to drink until they were completely inebriated, and then vomit in the street. But he had an eye for the information that could be gained. Maybe he also liked the humiliation that he could inflict on people. As Khrushchev said, when Stalin says dance, a wise man dances. Even in leisure, the threat from Stalin was always there for those closest to him. His inner circle were wary as they partied, and, you guessed it, Beria tried to cheat by drinking water, much to Stalin's annoyance. There's a brilliant chapter about Stalin's exploits in Montefiore, which you should read if you want to know just how studenty it really got. Put it this way, if there were traffic cones in Moscow, they would not have been left unmolested. But student hijinks were not the only games that were being played. The question of succession was starting to have an influence in politics. And Stalin knew this. Every one of his close political associates had their houses bugged. Presumably, the men who listened to their conversations, and might then know about them, were also bugged. Each of these potential successors was constantly waiting for opportunities to denounce and eliminate one another. The intrigue and conspiracies resembled nothing more than an imperial court. Stalin, of course, encouraged this, identifying the dividing lines in the Politburo and fueling the flames for diversity. As long as they were divided, they were less of a threat. As with a king, one man held absolute power, and swaying him was the means of becoming powerful in your own right. The courtiers must have had strange relationships with each other, equally terrified of Stalin and his vengeance, sometimes even conspiring to conceal things from him, but also competing for influence when they weren't cooperating, when it suited them. If the wolf started devouring Politburo members again, any one of them could be next. They knew that a purge could be wide and sweeping and end up catching up people who weren't thought of as victims in the beginning. The dictator's tactic of constantly changing people's positions was utilised to maintain control. Key was to change your position on individuals constantly. Not enough to create chaos, but enough to be sure that everyone was uncertain and afraid about their own status. He'd hint at favouritism, and then denounce you the next day for some minor failing. Everyone knew the rules of the game, and the stakes. Beria, who had operated a few wiretaps in his time, knew that the best way to deal with them was a policy of carefully controlling what he said at home. He would criticise Stalin and the regime just enough to avoid arousing suspicion that he was hiding something, but not enough to have him done away with. Around this time, Stalin found a new favourite secret policeman, Abakumov. Abakumov enjoyed personally torturing his victims, and was appointed head of the MGB, that's the precursor to the KGB. The NKVD and the KGB operated side by side in a weird police state balance of power. Abakumov technically worked for Beria, but Beria must have known that he was looking at his own replacement, waiting in the wings if he went too far. After all, if you remember, that was how he got the job, and how the guy before him got the job. First to fall out of favour in the Soviet Game of Thrones was the Bolshevik who'd been with Stalin the longest, Molotov. In late 1945, he was temporarily in charge of the government, first among equals in a committee of four, as Stalin recuperated from his heart trouble. Molotov had his own agenda. He wanted rapprochement with the West, and as a precursor to this, he ordered Pravda to publish a speech of Churchill's that praised Stalin. Reading this from his Dhaka, Stalin was furious and sent an angry telegram. Molotov compounded his mistake by drunkenly suggesting, in a telephone call to Stalin, that the regime should be more liberal with the media. Western media began to speculate about Molotov succeeding Stalin. When Molotov read those articles, his blood must have run cold. That was not the kind of prophecy you wanted hanging over your head. That was the kind of prophecy that would get you torn down. After furiously denouncing Molotov's unilateral actions, which were really very minor actions, to the other members of the Politburo, 
Stalin had him temporarily demoted. A grovelling telegram from Molotov saw him saying that he valued the party's trust more than life itself. The rebuke was clear. Molotov would not succeed Stalin. With, with his position dented, he was re-promoted, but he'd fallen out of favour. Beria, in charge of the atomic bomb project, which he was now desperate to make a success, had lost control of most of the NKVD, and much of his authority had gone to Abakamov. Another scandal arose out of the war. Stalin became angry about how many Soviet planes had crashed, blaming saboteurs, wreckers, and incompetence in the production of the planes. This would later become the great aviator's trial. Stalin had Abakamov arrest and torture the Air Force commander, and he in turn implicated Malenkov, an ally of Beria's on the Politburo. He was demoted and exiled. Stalin was signalling his attentions to Beria very clearly. He even started attacking him and the NKVD for, get this, extracting false confessions from the people they had denounced. This, quote, criminal activity could not be tolerated, even though Stalin himself had ordered it. The irony was doubled when you consider that he had another branch of secret police under Abakumov torturing people to extract confessions to use against Beria. Not that any of Stalin's pretexts had ever really mattered to him. This was about power, pure and simple. Still, the political pressure might help explain why he was so mean to the physicists. As I mentioned last episode, Marshal Zhukov's prestige was of concern to Stalin. Zhukov, who had no real desire to play politics, was also easily outmaneuvered. Mentioned increasingly less frequently by Stalin, Abakumov searched his home and discovered a rather large number of war trophies. Paintings, gold, shotguns, silk. And at the same time, the Air Force commander who was being arrested and tortured by Abakumov, and now served as a sort of squeeze box for confessions, testified that Zhukov was taking credit for the Soviet victory, and had openly criticised Stalin. Beria probably realised that he could please Stalin by wielding his little axe again, and he was key in instigating the investigations against Zhukov. He was apparently trying to remove him from power. The two definitely disliked each other. And it worked. The Politburo randed on Zhukov, accusing him of Bonapartism, trying to organise a military coup. Stalin didn't go this far. Zhukov was too popular and too well known to be disappeared in the same way as his enemies during the Great Terror. But Zhukov was demoted to a minor position in the Ural Mountains, and publicly disgraced. Marshal Kulik, the incompetent lover of cavalry, made some remarks on a bugged telephone line complaining about politicians stealing the credit from the generals, which is, of course, what Stalin had done. He was executed in 1950. And, you know, it's something of a miracle that Marshal Kulik, the bumbling fool, made it all the way to 1950, to be honest. But there were no show trials against the former military heroes. They were too well liked by the public. And Zhukov would return to politics after Stalin's death to exact his revenge on Beria. Marshal Zhukov's materialism was hardly uncommon, not just among the soldiers who engaged in widespread looting and retribution for the German looters, but also among Stalin's inner circle. Plenty of people have pointed out the ironies and hypocrisies in the Stalinist system. Just as they claim to be establishing socialism and economic equality, the higher echelons of the party lived in luxurious dakas, while often, for the people on the ground, there was not enough bread. They competed over who could have the finest and largest portrait of Stalin in their well-furnished offices. The intentional, pointed austerity of the early days of Bolshevism was gone, replaced by whatever luxuries the Soviet system could allow. But Stalin himself was never especially materialistic. He'd send a good deal of his money to friends and family, and aside from his general's uniform, his foreign films, and the occasional lavish banquet, he lived a fairly austere life. But those around him were more and more resembling the imperial court of the Tsar. Vasily Stalin, of course, has often been compared to the spoiled child of a Tsar, and the comparison bears some merit. He was still engaged in fearful drinking and partying. He even thought of himself, perhaps, as the heir to the throne, and he was scared of retribution from Stalin's underlings once Stalin died. His fears were justified, by the way. But the uneven spread of wealth was a means of control. With extra luxury and privilege reserved for party members and a state command over the economy, you can reward people for their loyalty. And at the same time, there's an incentive for the brightest and best people to join the party.
With Molotov out of favour, Zhukov shut down, and Beria under the watchful eye of Abakumov, no longer in control of the NKVD. Zdanov was Stalin's most likely successor. He, like Kirov, was in charge of the Leningrad party, and had also been placed in charge of cultural affairs, and he was the one who Stalin most frequently dropped his little hints about. Zdanov's cultural terror involved attacks on filmmakers, musicians, and the promotion of Russian nationalism. Perhaps the war made Stalin realise how useful this Russian nationalism was as a technique for maintaining control. It also came alongside a resurgent anti-Semitism. Stalin, before the war, did not have a long history as a particularly virulent anti-Semite. The Jews were persecuted under the Great Terror only insofar as every ethnic and religious minority was, because they might have had mixed loyalty towards the regime. But anti-Semitism was common in Russia, and it was used by the Tsars as a method of control. Anti-Jewish pogroms, or violent attacks on Jews, were common, and they'd been encouraged by the state as an outlet. After all, if they're blaming the Jews for their problems, they're not going to blame you. But there were Jewish members of the Politburo, and in the Communist Party. Stalin had publicly denounced anti-Semitism, which he viewed as against communist ideals, and punished with the death penalty. But at the same time, he'd flirted with it before, especially during his conflict with the Mensheviks, where they were more prominent. Essentially, before the war, Stalin had pursued anti-Semitic policies when it suited him. For example, in appeasing Hitler in 1939, he was almost certainly involved in the transfer of Jews. But he was not ideologically anti-Semitic during this time. But he became more and more so after the war. This was for a variety of reasons. Alongside the traditional perception of Jews as an internal enemy in a fifth column, a stateless people who owed no loyalty to the country. This portrayal naturally appealed to Stalin's paranoia, and after the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, his anti-Semitism hardened. Stalin had supported the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine, but only because he hoped that, due to the high number of Russian Jews, it would become a Soviet satellite state that would provide a base for communist power in the Middle East. It didn't work out this way, and the Israeli government came down firmly on the side of the USA in the Cold War. Russian Jews held a parade to welcome the ambassador to Israel in Moscow, and this display of what Stalin viewed as nationalism for a pro-Western country was the catalyst for a new, anti-Semitic purge that began in 1948. Museums and institutions were closed down. Stalin withdrew a lot of support for the Jewish culture that he'd given when he was angling for a pro-Soviet Israel, and eventually poets, cultural figures, and political allies who were Jewish were shot. By the end of 1952, Jews were being expelled from the government, and Stalin's rhetoric had become severe. He said, quote, Every Jewish nationalist is an agent of the American intelligence service. Jewish nationalists think that their nation was saved by the USA. They think that they're indebted to the Americans. Among doctors, there are many Jewish nationalists. End quote. His growing anti-Semitism was a sign of irrational paranoia, and the endless need to fight against some internal enemy, which we see throughout his reign. Note also his strange reference to the doctors. Stalin became convinced in the later years of his life that the doctors that he was treated by were attempting to kill him, and the fact that he conflates this with the Jewish threat starts to show you how you know, he's becoming more and more paranoid and irrational. Now, this need to fight against an internal enemy, it's beyond dealing with threats to his authority, and more the means by which that authority was always exercised. In the course of his anti-Semitic purges, he would denounce and arrest Molotov's wife, who was Jewish. He was further humiliated, as she endured imprisonment and lengthy denunciations from the prisoners that Abakumov was torturing. Moreover, he was forced to divorce her, and even vote for her expulsion from the party for being a Jewish nationalist. Eventually, she was sentenced to five years in the Gulag, though many thought that she was already dead. Imagine, then, being Molotov at a Politburo meeting, forced to sit and work with Stalin, who had denounced your wife and sent her off to some unknown fate. And all the while, Beria was there. He liked to taunt Molotov with the fact that he knew what had happened to his wife. He'd whisper, She's alive. Zdanov's culture war, which included the persecution of musicians on political and cultural grounds, was not especially popular. 
Khrushchev didn't have much positive stuff to say about it. He said, I think Stalin's cultural policies, especially the cultural policies imposed on Leningrad through Zdanov, were cruel and senseless. You can't regulate the development of literature, art and culture with a stick or by barking orders. You can't lay down a furrow and then harness all your artists to make sure they don't deviate from the straight and narrow. If you try to control your artists too tightly, there will be no clashing of opinions, consequently no criticism, and consequently no truth. There will just be a gloomy stereotype, boring and useless. End quote. And so often it does seem like he's describing Soviet culture that way. The suppression of individuality was immense. Meanwhile, Zdanov, while still focusing on every aspect of the culture war, was dispatched to deal with a new threat. The Yugoslav Communist parties had now been installed as the government of Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito. And this was one of the few places in the post-war settlement where the government was not a direct puppet communist party of Stalin's, but instead a homegrown communist organisation. So after the war, you know, in the settlement, Stalin had set up his own puppet communist parties and they'd taken over most of these eastern bloc states and ran them on the behalf of the USSR. Now you might think that having the partisans in charge in Yugoslavia was good. After all, if a good number of people are genuinely sympathetic to communism in the country, and they have their own homegrown beloved leader to deal with, rather than some nobody who is obviously a puppet of Moscow, the regime is probably more stable. But Tito's own popularity and the fact that his Yugoslav partisans had liberated the country from the Nazis and not the Red Army meant that he had a greater independence, and Stalin could not tolerate this, especially when Yugoslavia began provocatively seizing territory and provoking the Western Allies. They intervened in the Greek Civil War on the Communist side, even though Stalin had promised Churchill in their naughty document that Greece was in the British sphere of influence. But more than any specific political annoyances, that upset the Western Allies, Stalin was probably irritated that Tito continually defied his authority. A combination of Tito's nationalism and pride, and his eventual territorial ambitions, which probably involved setting up an independent Balkan bloc of communist countries outside of Stalin's control. All of these factors rendered him unacceptable to Stalin. He hoped that by withdrawing Soviet support from the Yugoslav communists, the regime would collapse. I'll shake my finger, and there'll be no more Tito, Stalin shouted. Zdanov was tasked with informing the Yugoslavians that they were no longer officially recognised by the USSR as a legitimate communist party, and made the ludicrous claim that Tito was an imperialist spy. But despite Stalin's attempts to shake his little finger and assassinate Tito, he would remain in place, which was something of an embarrassment to Stalinist supremacy. However, Stalin, again, certainly had a grudging respect for Tito, as he seemed to have for anyone who defied his authority. And here we return to one of the threads of our series, the third letter that was reportedly discovered in Stalin's desk. Alongside the note from Lenin denouncing him, and alongside the note from Bukharin begging for his life, the third note was from Tito. Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow, and I won't have to send a second. The model for communist strongmen had been made by Lenin and perfected by Stalin. It's interesting to see what happens when he faces off against someone, with the same purported ideology and similar tactics. The diplomatic efforts, and probably the sheer stress of being one of Stalin's Politburo underlings, took its toll on Zdanov, who was severely alcoholic. After a medical misdiagnosis, he suffered a series of heart attacks and died in 1948. Rumours that he was murdered by his doctors seem unrealistic. If Stalin wanted him murdered, he would have had him died in his sleep via poison, or else he would have just denounced and executed him as an example. Stalin always had an excuse prepared to denounce and destroy his underlings. He kept files on all of them, not that he really needed to. If you're thinking that this constant juggling of underlings made enacting policy difficult, the answer is yes and no. There was a single party line that everyone conformed to on most matters. This was the stuff that was personally dictated by Stalin's. Individuals had a lot of free will to behave autonomously, but Stalin closely watched their actions and would pounce on anything he didn't like. The issue with Stalin's autocracy and the fear he created in the minds of his cabinet was less to do with the bureaucratic chaos as management changed, and more to do with the fact that everyone felt insecure in their position. <laughs> 
That's ideal if you're a dictator who wants to maintain power over these people, but terrible if you want to change the system or reform it, because any faults or concerns that Stalin was not aware of, or didn't want to deal with, were very difficult to communicate to him. He couldn't micromanage everything, although he often tried, but revealing flaws and failures left you open to denunciation by one of the other members of the Politburo. Stalin was not wholly ignorant, but his subordinates were incentivized by the terror to conceal information from him, and since he couldn't manage everything, this was bad for the state. Zdanov's death swung the power struggle back in favour of the other members of the Politburo once again. Beria and Melenkov came back into favour. Indeed, it was said that on the nights of Zdanov's death, every pub in Moscow was filled with Beria's associates drinking to the good news. The carousel of Stalin's associates and underlings wheeled around once again. Malenkov and Beria, temporarily back in favour with the boss, used their new position to, f to fuel Stalin's suspicions. Just as Kirov had used Leningrad as a separate power centre in 1934, might it not also be the case that Zdanov had done something similar? The city's military and industrial heroes were very popular locally, due to the fact that they'd helped Leningrad endure its brutal siege and you can imagine that they might feel quite separate from the rest of the country after 900 days in the siege. The city had always been the ancient capital of Russia, and might prove a rallying point for resistance. In addition, the Leningrad wing of the party had always been a slightly separate power base to Moscow, pursuing different policies. This meant that often the man in charge of Leningrad had been a key ally of Stalin's like Kirov. The leading figures in the Leningrad party, like Voznesensky and Kuznetsov, were Politburo members or high-ranking MKVD officials. But Beria and Malenkov worked together, criticising the Leningrad party, which was full of Zdanov's old allies. They said that they were holding independent rallies, covering up scandals, and engaging in some vague conspiracy to split up the Soviet Union in favour of a Soviet Russia, with Leningrad as the new capital. Stalin barely needed any persuading to see conspiracies and enemies everywhere. He was not entirely disloyal to the memory of Zdanov, who had never entirely fallen out of favour, and he even encouraged Svetlana to marry Zdanov's son, which she did. Svetlana should really get a special episode all to herself, and maybe I'll do it one day, and please give me feedback about the special episodes that you'd like to hear. But familial ties aside, Zdanov's old political associates and comrades were doomed. Soon enough, the arrests of the Leningrad affair began. The two Politburo members were arrested and tortured by Abakamov, although notably they were told to leave Zdanov out of any testimony they'd give. I suppose that's just in case they implicated someone who was supposed to be innocent in Stalin's mind. This was his way. Write history according to whatever conspiracy theory you believe today, and implicate the people you've decided already are guilty. It was a mini-terror, and the first really violent purge of key political associates since the war. Kuznetsov had other ideas and refused to confess. I'm a Bolshevik and remain one in spite of the sentence I have received. History will justify us. His defiance is nicely recorded for the histories, but of course it made no difference, and both of the Leningraders were shot. Along with them, hundreds of associates and key members of the Leningrad elite were exiled to Siberia, deprived of their property, and removed from their positions of power and influence. Intellectuals and scientists were especially badly hit by the Leningrad purge since the aim here was really to destroy the claim of the city to be a rival to Moscow on any level. The museum dedicated to the siege was closed. Having endured 900 days of torment, bombardment, starvation and unimaginable suffering, the city was further damaged and repressed by its own leader, just four years after the war ended. This nasty little political bloodbath had consolidated the power of Beria, Malenkov and Khrushchev, all of whom had signed the death warrants, and were the last few in the clique who hadn't fallen from grace. There's some evidence that, when Stalin recalled Khrushchev from the Ukraine where he'd been ruling before the war, he did so in order for him to act as a counterbalance to the new bloc of Beria and Malenkov, who were rising again, but instead they formed a loose but noticeable clique. But none of them could feel themselves safe. Stalin was ageing, ailing, in ill health, and directing more and more of the business of state via telegram from his Dhaka, during lengthy holidays to recuperate, but he was as vicious as ever in persecuting anyone who seemed like they might be a threat. After the Leningrad affair, Abakumov fell from favour and was quickly liquidated himself, the latest in a long Stalinist tradition of secret policemen who end up being shot by their own forces. <laughs> 
If Stalin asks you to be the head of the NKVD, you should probably write your own will alongside the death lists. Given the rate at which he killed them, it's a miracle that none of them ever attempted a serious coup. These holidays are yet another strange scenario to imagine Stalin in. From the upstart revolutionary to the scheming party member, through the first among equals de facto ruler, via the awfulness of the Great Terror to dictatorial control. Then we have the warlord bristling about Moscow, sleeping on a divan in the metro, or in his office and issuing volleys of orders, receiving constant reports. We have the triumphant hero, the global statesman, the master of Yalta, the saviour of the USSR. And now, we have the puttering old tyrant, alone in his dakas with his bodyguard. He'd entertain guests. In one instance, Svetlana came to stay. They had a fight when she wanted to return to Moscow, and eventually Stalin relented. Go if you want! I can't make you stay! But you aren't in a stranger's house. Later, in a letter to her, he'd claim that he wasn't lonely without her. Svetlana eventually defected to the USA, and described her father as a moral monster. But she never lost sight of the fact that her father showed more love to her than anyone else after Naja died. Maybe anyone else in his life. For whatever reasons, she preferred to go along with the line that Stalin should not be held solely responsible, and her memoirs did shift a lot of the blame of the terror onto Beria and Yezov. But this was not an uncommon view in Russia at the time. Navigating your relationship with your parents can be difficult at the best of times. Svetlana would always be overshadowed by her father, a political prisoner of her name, as she said to herself. It is fair to say that they did not and could not have had a normal relationship. Stalin was just incapable of that. This is not a trait unique to tyrants, and nor is it a trait of all tyrants, but it was true of him. There was no way to break the cycle of mistrust and isolation. As he displayed signs of senility, as many old men do, he displayed signs of nostalgia, reminiscing to his bodyguards about Nadja, and even his first wife, Kato. But the man who had spent so much time rewriting history and forcibly destroying the bonds of human affection found that he had no history and could find little affection in his old age. This was reflected by the memoirs of those around him who generally described his physical and mental decline, saying that he was jittery in his old age and that he swung to extremes. Stalin was even more damned by Khrushchev after Stalin's death. He essentially dismissed him as senile and paranoid towards the end of his life. Stalin would get no comfort from those he terrified. Instead, as ever, he focused on politics and the international situation. The post-war settlement in Europe had left Germany occupied by the British, Americans and Russians, divided up into four sectors, and they each had half of the capital, Berlin. When the US voted for the Marshall Plan, providing financial aid to countries that had been damaged by the war, and they started to introduce a new currency to their half of Germany and Berlin, Stalin felt that he was being economically undermined. Indeed, the citizens of Berlin began changing their currency into the Western Deutschmark. Stalin imposed the Berlin blockade in 1948, hoping to force the Western Allies to abandon their half of Berlin. The whole city was deep in Soviet territory. The Allies got around it via a massive airlift of supplies to the encircled city. It was one of the first bluffs and counterbluffs of the Cold War. The Red Army massively outnumbered the US and British forces in the city, and their air force could easily have stopped the airlift, but neither side was willing to open hostilities on a third world war. Tensions were high in the city itself. There was a near riot when the communists attempted to take over the municipal government. This would, of course, just be the start for the suffering of Berlin, a city that would be divided for another 40 years. After months of blockade and resupply, the Soviets backed down in May 1949 and lifted the blockade. Stalin had been tested and beaten, but the standoff continued. In 1949, the Allies created the Federal Republic of Germany, which late West Germany it would later be known, and a month later Stalin and the Kremlin would create East Germany in response. If you want to look at things through a Marxist viewpoint, this era after the war, and using the war as an excuse, was about him establishing communist countries in as many nations as possible. Yet it's also clear that his idea of communism meant strict hegemonic control from Moscow, once socialism was established, national borders and divides were just supposed to melt away. The only true divide, after all, was meant to be that between the working class and the bourgeoisie. But of course, in practice, this didn't happen. In 
Stalin was as frustrated by the other communist movements that weren't directly under his control as he was by the Western Allies, as shown by the way he continually tried to have Tito assassinated. In 1949, the leader of the Communist Party in China, Chairman Mao, took over, and was originally deferential to Stalin. He said, quote, Stalin is the leader of the world revolution. This is of paramount importance. It is a great event that mankind is blessed with Stalin. Since we have him, things can go well. As you know, Marx is dead and so are Engels and Lenin. Had there been no Stalin, who would there be to give directions? But having him, this really is a blessing. Now there exists in the world a Soviet Union, a Communist Party, and also a Stalin. Thus the affairs of the world can go well. But of course, Mao was saying this when his armies still needed Soviet financial and military support. So you have to take this deference with a grain of salt. They met for the first time in 1949, but of course there was little comradely cheer to go around. Mao was put up in a minor hotel rather than Stalin's Dhaka, as Churchill had been. He described trying to extract aid from the Soviets as like taking meat from the mouth of a tiger. Enraged when Stalin stalled in meeting him, he yelled at the walls of his apartment, which he knew had been booked. I am here to do more than eat and shit. They may have shared an ideology, but in many ways, like religious extremists, they found minor points of the doctrine to fight about, to conceal the rivalries and suspicions. Stalin was suspicious that Mao was not a true urban revolutionary, but instead focused on the peasants. Again, Marxism's inability to deal with them would come up. They could have negotiated a Sino-Soviet treaty that would have coordinated their efforts and frustrated the West, but instead there were long silences and mutual suspicions and hostility. It is one of the great questions of history. If the communist movement had remained unified and there was no split between the Soviets and the Chinese, would things have turned out differently in the Cold War? As it was, the two leaders would continually eye each other with a deep suspicion. Things were immediately tested when the communist leader of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, asked for permission to invade the South. The peninsula had been divided in the Soviet invasion of the Japanese territory at the end of the war. Stalin demurred, asking Mao and the Koreans to come to an agreement together. In 1950 they invaded and the Korean War began. Like many conflicts that pitted non-communists against communists, the whole affair quickly became a proxy war, just like Vietnam and the Spanish Civil War before it, between the two ideologies. Stalin was boycotting the UN, and so he didn't use the veto when they intervened, and with Stalin's blessing, a proxy war between the US and Communist China began. Stalin was unwilling to get bogged down in a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, but he used his influence to encourage Mao to do so. He was probably hoping for a quick war that would be over before it had the chance to begin. No escalation into a Third World War, which every conflict now had the potential to become. Which begs the question of why he didn't support the North Koreans more. They were armed and equipped later on, but after the US intervention it meant that the war would necessarily drag on and end in a stalemate. Stalin's policy was muddled, almost intervening but not quite, and it ended badly for the Soviets and escalated tensions with the West. A lot of blood was lost and very little changed. And of course we're still living with the ramifications of that settlement today. With Stalin frail and beginning to make increasingly dubious decisions on policy, we'll leave it here for this episode. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating and review on iTunes, which helps to get us noticed. Uh, leave ratings and reviews on your favourite podcatcher anywhere. That way I don't have to play the podcast through massive speakers smuggled onto public transport and then leave sheepishly at the next stop. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. Next time we will, finally, see the end of Stalin. One last paranoid plot against his allies and associates would be foiled only by his death. I'm then going to quickly deal with what happened after his death, and that most complex of questions. Stalin transformed and terrorised the Soviet Union. His was a reign of endless conflict, against internal enemies, real or imagined, against non-communist ideologies, against Russia's backwardness, against the Nazis, against the West, and against his own paranoia. Did he win? What was Stalin's legacy? Until then, be kind to each other.